Welcome back to the ANC Leadership Series with Peter Guber. Here, he shares how to connect with people's emotions to achieve success, his history with the NBA and how he landed the Golden State Warriors, and that documentary with a certain boxing legend. In your book, also, you talk a lot about how you see yourself working in the emotional transformational business and how you've used this to suck in engaging partners, employees, yes. shareholders by simply telling a compelling story. Now, if we're to take your experience and apply it into our daily lives as normal human beings, what's the most basic thing that we can do to achieve success? When you want to move people emotionally, if you move them emotionally and they own the process, they own the story mm -hmm. that you tell them, they can pay it forward. They can evangelize for you. They can be uh, advocates for what you want. They're, that's the power of it. It's viral. Uh, and, and if you don't surrender that proprietorship, if you don't learn and coach yourself to turn it over to them, so it's their story that they're paying forward for the benefit you want, mm -hmm. you never really can energize the kind of response you want. Mm -hmm. So I think that's the most important thing is to be able to surrender the proprietorship of your story. Certainly, a comedian wants you to tell, retell the joke to yeah. somebody. Yeah. They want you to do that. So the idea is uh, recognition of letting go of it. Uh, passing it for paying it forward mm -hmm. and you know emotional transportation works when somebody understands the meaning and value proposition and they get it here yeah. not to just get it here they get it here mm -hmm. and that makes all the difference in the world mm -hmm. and I think the power of your story is that it can live on in the retelling and that's what makes it so energizable right. and you have to have that intention mm -hmm. if you have the intention of having them tell your story you're going to lose. It's got to be their, their story. story. All right. Well, since you wrote your book, 2011, things have changed so much hmm. in the last seven years. So many changes in platforms, technology, all that. Uh, in today's world, how can good stories still make money for a storyteller in an environment that changes so rapidly? Yeah, but human beings haven't changed rapidly. Human right. beings haven't yeah. evolved. If you go back mm -hmm. 10,000 years, they looked like just like you and I. Yeah, mm -hmm. they didn't have the suit, they didn't have the television mm -hmm. cameras, they didn't have the digital watch, but they, they were just, they were around their campfire and they uh -huh. told stories. Yeah. Those stories meant the survival of their species. Mm -hmm. It gave the st statistics, facts, data, strategies to that tribe so they could pass them along. How did they do it? Around a flick, that was the first television, the flickering campfire. Mm -hmm. And that emotional story of song and dance which passed along those things, there was no written language at that mm -hmm. time, allowed them to survive. Yeah. So what we're talking about is something that's endemic to human beings. Mm -hmm. And when you abandon it for just for efficiency, and you say, well, I want to be in a digital world, we're in a digital world. But digital world makes contact, not connection. Human mm -hmm. beings make connection. Yeah. Intention is a part of it. Mm -hmm. So the idea is, at both ends of the food chain, is analog. So the idea is you have to have to respond to the basic human needs of people. Mm -hmm. And you know, we, I used to say it all I, all the time in my classes. You know, zeros and ones don't move anybody. If I say on off on off off on on off, or o one o one o one, you don't get it. Mm -hmm. The oohs and ahs yeah, that get it. It's, right. So the idea of moving a person emotionally engages them. And that's true in the digital world. Mm -hmm. All the digital world does is shorten the distance between artists, broadly defined, and audiences. Mm -hmm. So the idea of recognizing what's in it for you, yeah. what's the benefit you want, mm -hmm. not how it's delivered, what's the benefit you want. If I can do that, I can engage you. I can energize you. I can motivate you. I can get you to own the story and pay it forward or do the actions that we want. Mm -hmm. So the difference is not very much. Mm -hmm. It's a tool. It's not the answer. All right. Well. Speaking of stories, there's one story that really caught our attention and we'd want you to share it with us again uh, in person this time. There was a story about Muhammad Ali and how you were going to work on a docu-film with him. And it happened to do with something that happened here in Manila, the thriller in Manila, right? Tell us a bit about that unique experience you had with Muhammad Ali. Well, I did, a, I did and the I is a funny word. The I is ego word, okay. but our team did, we did mm -hmm. um, three movies in various frames with Muhammad Ali mm -hmm. in his career. with his with his rights, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And um, when I was a young man uh, running Columbia Pictures, uh, it was a big studio in, in America. I was very young. I think I was 29, something like that. And um, uh, Muhammad Ali, we bought Muhammad Ali's book, The Greatest. We just bought the book, the rights to the book. And he uh, we had a big photography session, congratulations, shaking hands, shaking mm -hmm. hands, great, 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 great. I went to lunch with him. He's quite a, quite, was quite a man. And next day, uh, Ali called me on the phone and said, I want you to gather all the men and women who are going to sell my movie around in the room. Mm -hmm. I want to talk to them. I said, Ali, you just bought the book. There's no script. 
There's no director. There's no cast. It'll be a year and a half before all those things happen. Then you can come in. He said, no, 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 no. Gather them all. Wow. I want them in. I want to tell them. I want, I want to speak to them. I said, okay, let me get back to you. So I walked into the chairman of the company. I said, Ali called and said <laughs> uh, he wants everybody to you know, gather on. He wants to tell a story about how to sell and make this film and how to sell it. Mm -hmm. And the man who was the chairman of the company said, that's ridiculous. He said, that's absolutely ridiculous. We're not ready to make the movie. It's a waste of time. Tell him it's a waste of time. He said, here's his number. You could go call him. He said, no, that's your job. You call him. <laughs> okay. So I went back to my office. I thought about it a little while. And I called him on the phone. He said, Ali, when do you want to come in? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so he came in. Okay. And he told it, told it to uh, the, the staff. Mm -hmm. And the staff didn't understand why this guy was telling about a movie okay. that was a year and a half off if, mm -hmm. we, if we even decided to make it. Mm -hmm. And they all sat there with their arms folded, all secure. He saw that they weren't responding. Mm. So he got up and told the story. Got him about, he says, I'm going to tell you the story about the thriller Manila. Wow. And he went and he said, you're all going to stand up and box with us <laughs> for, uh, 10 rounds. We're going to go 10 rounds. Your arms up we're gonna, and you have a minute in between. And they all got up and had to do it. And after about the third round, they started laughing and carrying on and dancing around. And they were so pooped. He made the expression. He said, look, yeah. if you're not prepared, he told them the whole fight, how he had prepared, how he had a strategy. If you're not prepared, mm -hmm. you get knocked out. Yeah. They loved the story. Wow. They all took pictures with him. They put the pictures on the wall, <laughs> and they retold that story <laughs> to all the exhibitors and everybody that came in wow. about his film and mm -hmm. what he did. And it made a big difference in the marketing of his film. Fantastic. So, yeah, stories are po a story's a powerful tool yeah. that everybody uses, even though they don't know they're using yeah. it. Yeah. What a guy, what a guy. All right. Now, a lot of your fans here today, you know, who are coming today and, and even who, who, who are eager to hear from you, obviously want to hear the story about the Warriors and how, you know, why you made that big jump. Of course, you've been involved in, in professional sports teams in the past and you've made your big uh, attempts in other teams. But there was a lot of criticism around that deal that they were only a 22 and 60 team. They haven't won a title in 40 years, but you had a grand plan. You had a grand dream. So tell us a bit about how you really went for that big swing with the Warriors. Well, yes, as I say, I failed at getting different teams, different businesses uh, many times. Uh, you, you had to look at uh, uh, the decision, not from hindsight, but from foresight. You know, if we all did everything from hindsight, yeah. it would be great. It would be easy to just, just make winners, you know. But in foresight, you looked and said, what is it now? There are only 30 teams in the NBA. Mm -hmm. Though that means there's a locked-in system. There's, not, there's no more. They're not making no more. You don't get no more. Okay, that's one mm -hmm. benefit. Second benefit, San Francisco was a very unique market. Mm -hmm. It was a large market. Uh, there was only one team there. Mm -hmm. And the problem was it was underserved and underutilized. That was the opportunity. Mm -hmm. It was a problem in disguise. It was mm -hmm. an opportunity in disguise. The problem was the opportunity in disguise. Mm -hmm. So you said to yourself, if you could build it, will they come? If you could build a really good franchise, mm -hmm. will you be able to energize that market? You looked at the whole market and yeah. said, the opportunity's there, but we haven't pr provided a product that really aligns with that opportunity. Mm -hmm. So we saw that as a, not as a liability, but as a possibility and a profitability if we could do it right. Mm -hmm. And then the third thing we felt, which was really interesting, is that we brought a new spirit to the, to the team. My partner, Joe Lakeup, and Bob Myers, the, the, uh, the president of basketball operations, Rick Wells, brought great management to it. Mm -hmm. And we said, you folks do it. Mm -hmm. You get this thing working right. You, we, we empowered our organization to, to not be risk averse, mm -hmm. to take chances, uh, to build an organization that had the hearts and minds of our audience in mind, mm -hmm. and to recognize that winning was crucial, mm -hmm. but we had to recognize that we had to pay attention to our audience. We looked at the business that was there before. It took its audience for granted and was running on low fumes. Mm -hmm. And we felt that if we could capitalize the company correctly, mm -hmm. had some patience, we would turn the corner and get a little lucky. Got to get a little yeah, lucky. Yeah, yeah. And so I think that's what, that, that's what it was. And the, the, the men and women yep. of our organization really did a superb job. It's them that would be congratulated, along with, of course, the players.